What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Tune in to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Thursdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project. Podcasting and archived at madnessradio.net. Thanks for tuning in to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. And today we have Philip Doughty. Philip is an award-winning uh, journalist who's written extensively for the alternative press. He's a past um, staff writer for the Seattle Weekly. He's a reporter and does policy analysis and writes about mental health. And he has a fantastic uh, website that I encourage people to um, check out. It's a tr- really, really good resource for late-breaking news and deep analysis of what's going on with pharmaceutical companies and what's going on uh, with mental health policy. And uh, we're going to be speaking specifically about um, force drugging, force treatment, force, the use of force in the mental health system. His website is FuriousSeasons.com. That's FuriousSeasons.com. So thanks a lot for joining us today on Madness Radio, Philip Doughty. Hi, Will. Thanks. Yeah, and it's it's great to have you back. We had you on, I guess, maybe about a year ago, was it? It was a little over a year ago, right around the time of the Zyprexa document stuff. Right, right. And so, and there's there's a lot to talk about. So I I'm really happy to have you um, back on on the show. So we're going to be kind of focusing on this this really haunting question that we have as a society because it seems like every single time somebody gets killed or there's some dramatic massacre or some violent tragedy or hap- that happens and the person has any kind of mental health background or has been diagnosed or been in the system, then this debate just comes up again about forcing people into treatment, forcing them into hospitals, forcing them onto, onto drugs. And, you know, we've been very vocal about um, being against that and that kind of knee-jerk response and I really wanted to have you on the show to really kind of get more deeply into these into these issues so um, you were saying that that re- pretty recently there was um, some terrible murder that happened in you're in Seattle so there's some something that happened in, in Seattle you want to tell us about that or well and, and and keep in mind this all still technically flies under the terminology of alleged and all of that because there has not been a trial yet um, uh, Basically, what happened is a, a, a gentleman who, I mean, saying he's diagnosed with schizophrenia is putting it too kindly. Um, a guy named James Aaron Williams, who grew up in Arkansas and somehow ended up out here about 10 or 15 years ago um, and shot somebody downtown back then, completely psychotic. And he is a, the, the poor fellow is a, 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 a uh, for, for whom I have a fair amount of sympathy, is a, a very paranoid schizophrenic, a uh, very profound case of it. And he went to jail for 10 years and apparently was quite a, uh, quite a management issue, as they would call it in, in the prison system. Came out about two years ago and was living in a group home um, about five or six blocks from where I am sitting right now. And he apparently kept going on and off his medication. The system kept trying to get him committed. The system wouldn't commit him because you know, by the time he would show up and be interviewed by a uh, by the appropriate person here, you know, he was kind of in the clear and they wouldn't commit him. And on New Year's Eve, literally about five hours before midnight, he um, he hacked a woman to death in my neighborhood, and a very nice woman who I did not know personally, but a lot of people I don't did know, and um, and a, a nice progressive liberal woman who works for the Sierra Club or worked for the Sierra Club. And he stabbed her 17 times. This isn't just a mild stabbing. There's, there's no information that they had any sort of relationship or contact whatsoever. This, unfortunately, this appears to have been one of these cases of a, uh, you know, a deeply schizophrenic guy who, who went off his medication and uh, had a really bad response and flipped out and killed somebody. And... Uh, there have been there's been a lot of media coverage of it here. Uh, there was a big article in the Seattle Post Intelligencer this week. You know, really about the question of because they have several hundred uh, people in Washington State, and I'm sure they do in every state, who are in a program, um, and I can't remember the official name, but it's essentially a program where they give special monitoring and care to these guys who are known as dangerously. Da- what do they call them? They call them dangerous mentally ill offenders. These are, these are guys, and, and it's almost always guys who've gotten out of prison who are still deemed to be a very, 
very big risk. Um, right. So there's a. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of a, a a sort of a picture perfect story for the the media to sort of latch onto and then say, okay, here it is. Mentally ill people are violent and crazy, and if if there's really not what you can do except just keep them locked up and keep them on their medication, and then sort of that's sort of the extreme case. But then there's the other cases of people who are potentially violent or might have been be angry or something, and then we want to prevent them from reaching the point. And so what, what what would you say to someone who says, well, there you go, Philip, this is an example. You know, if he's schizophrenic, you got to just keep him locked up. You can't put him in a group home. You got to, if he doesn't want to take his medications, you got to force it, force him to take his medication. I mean, isn't this a really a kind of like a clear cut example of, of course we have to lock up. The, 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 this guy is a more clear cut example than most examples. Unfortunately, because of privacy laws and so on and so forth, there's not as much information about sort of the medical details of this guy's case that I would like to get. So I'm really sort of torn in in this particular case because it's not clear to me whether this guy was somebody who was just blowing off his meds and that was his problem or whether he was one of those poor people who for whom medication really doesn't do a heck of a lot. Um, I mean, the, the reality is, and there are researchers who are now finally starting to say this publicly, there's about 10 to 20 percent of people diagnosed with schizophrenia for whom medication just does nothing. It just does nothing. Um, and it's, it's, it's frustrating for everybody, um, um, obviously for the, for the, for the, for the schizophrenic most, most of all. Um, but yeah, this is a good case. It flies all the, the the big issues of violence amongst the mentally ill, which is widely perceived to, you know, be very high, um, as well as questions of you know liberty and treatment and all that other stuff. It really brings them to the fore. Um, what deeply concerns me is there are now people in the in the state of Washington system who are floating the idea, and certainly the PI sort of poked at it this week when they wrote about it, that well, maybe there are a group of mentally ill people who are too dangerous to have in society at all. So after their jail terms or whatever, um, we need to keep them in a facility for the rest of their lives. You know, they're like these level four sex offenders who we have on an island in this state. That's what I was, that's the comparison that I, people who think, people who think that we're being extreme when we say, oh, we're just going to start creating this subclass of people who are just totally separated from society should should think that actually we're starting we've actually started to kind of done that with sex offenders in a lot of ways and and we 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 have and I've got to tell you with sex offenders I think in 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 a good number of the cases I think the the extra well what would you call it po- the post prison the post prison incarceration for lack of a better term um is warranted some of these uh, unfortunately some of these cats are just so messed up and I I hate to use that terminology but that's the truth of it. Well, it raises it raises a lot of issues. I mean, part of it is um, with the example of the of the murder that you talked about, which is a terrible tragedy. I mean, we have so little information. All we have are like some sound bites, um, a very sketchy story. We don't know what kind of experiences this person had in the system. We don't know what kinds of trauma Correct. the person was going Correct. through. We don't know what was tried in terms of helping then we don't know what the immediate stressors were that were right before. You know, there's just there's just so much. So it just becomes this kind of car- cartoon land um, sort of debate that we have. And when, even when we say the word sex offender, like what exactly are, are we talking about? I mean, it's, you know, so so we have to, there's a certain level of kind of a witch hunting, sort of get a crowd and have a bunch of torches and just go marching off and without <laughs> even having really a good, clear examination of what these different factors are because clearly it is complicated and that's why I think that that society kind of moves into really counterproductive um, directions is because people don't really understand a lot of the issues. One of the things that you, you mentioned is you mentioned about how the studies are starting to come out that say, look, a large percentage, even even the mainstream studies are saying that a large percentage of people just don't get helped by the medication. Then you put on top of that a lot of the research that's been done that isn't recognized by the mainstream. And then you took look at studies about how alternative approaches or the Soteria House uh, model, psychosocial rehabilitation, trauma approaches. Um, and then then you add on to that the whole question of, well, violence and medication withdrawal, there's a lot of evidence that there's a connection between if someone is on medication, they go off suddenly, 
then that can be causing suicidal or homicidal kinds of, of impulses and, and the relationship there. So it's, it's really, it's just really a complicated, a complicated issue. Um, so maybe instead of trying to focus specifically on that, um, that story, because we don't have um, enough information about it, maybe we should, let's just talk about this whole thing in general. I mean, are people who are diagnosed with mental illness more dangerous than the rest of the society? I mean, the studies that I've seen say no. My experience has been pe- working with people at the Freedom Center that, that know that that's, that's not the case. The guy who, whose research I point to on that question is Jeff Swanson at, at Duke University in North Carolina. He's done, a, uh, he's done almost 20 years of research on this question, and he keeps coming up with... And again, it depends on how you measure risk and what statistics you're using. Uh, but the reality is is that even people with the most profound cases of mental illness, and here we're really talking about you know, paranoid schizophrenia, the prevalence of violence amongst them is only slightly increased as compared to the general population. It's, it's, it's just not that much higher, and in most cases, people with diagnosed with the disorder are, are, are frankly much more likely to be victims of trauma, violence, et cetera, et cetera. I know a schizophrenic here in Seattle who is, you know, regularly attacked by homeless guys um, who want his money. I mean, every time he comes out of his housing unit, it's, it's basically a run for his, I don't want to say it's a run for his life, but he's set upon by other folks in the system. Um, it's really, really, really discouraging. Yeah, the, um, the the connection between being a trauma survivor and people who have experienced been victims of violence and then getting diagnosed and being in the system. And also, even, even just the word schizophrenic, I mean, I was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, uh, which is a kind of schizophrenia. I know many people who have a schizophrenia diagnosis. There is no way you could you could tell them from other people. I mean, that's the mythology here, is that we have this stereotype that when someone's a paranoid schizophrenic, they're always in a psychotic episode. Well, people go in and out of extreme states oh, I know. that even the, using the word psychotic for their episode, well, well, maybe they're just having a flashback from their trauma. Maybe there is a con- context going on. Maybe there's stress issues that are involved so that the way in which we understand and stereotype that we have, it's really like schizophrenic, serial killer, psychotic, mass murder. It's really part of this cultural thing that we have of, of a fear of this madman who's kind of out there on the um, on the outskirts of a society, and then we have to kind of keep them away, and then we have to keep them away, and we have to keep away the sex offenders, and then there's the terrorists, and you know, and then we go back to the witches, and then well, you know, I I can't speak to all of this, but you know, my own experience being around folks with schizophrenia, as as well as, and I'm talking about people with really serious schizophrenia, as as well as. Um, having done some service providing with some of them, because I actually have worked in a very, very intense homeless shelter situation. But my 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 general impression is is most of these people on or off meds are actually remarkably gentle and just would like to be left the heck alone, um, and and try to get some kind of life going for themselves. Well, I have to say that's been my experience too, and I think often it's because people are very sensitive. That's why they end up being really hurt by their experiences or their trauma or society and not fitting in and then they go into these yeah. extreme places and i mean the, the other the other factors are just are social factors because there's so much of it is really about poverty and it's about not having a stable place to live and not having a stable context and then if you add on all the medical conditions that people have malnutrition is really widespread but you know i think one of the one of the biggest overlooked issues in mental health care and i don't care if we're talking about treating somebody with a light case of depression or anxiety all the way up to the most profound cases of psychosis and schizophrenia is the t- the two things that are just blown off by the system. Um, One is housing. People have got to have some form of stable housing where they're safe. And two is people have got to eat, flat out have got to eat. And I know that probably will, will send half your audience into titters of laughter because it's so obvious and basic. But I can assure you that a a huge number of people with severe mental illness basically are starving themselves most of the time. Yeah, or or their eating is so irregular that they just kind of throw their whole system. And I would add to that is sleep. I mean, people say that there's this image that you have have a mental illness and then you become homeless. Well, actually, a lot of times what happens is that people go become homeless and then they develop these really, really difficult 
states or the states that they had before get much, much worse because they're not getting regular sleep. They have, they're not safe. They don't have any food that they can eat. And I'm, I just try it as an example. Just try living on the streets for a few days or try even for some of us, just like just traveling can be incredibly um, stressful. And then imagine being in that situation for um, you know, night after night after night, maybe you're, you're cold. So you're drinking alcohol as a way of numbing yourself from being cold. So there's so much that can be, that can be looked at this and absolutely the, the nutrition thing is, is huge. So, um, just in terms of, of getting back to this whole question of forced, um, drugging, sure. I mean, let's, let's talk about it from just from the medical standpoint for a moment. I mean, there's this image that we have of like, well, let's just force these people on their drugs and they'll get better. But actually that's not, that's just not the case in terms of the, the research that's, that's coming out. You, you know, the, 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 this is kind of, what I'm giving you here is kind of a mix of what the research base shows, what what different researchers have told me, and sort of what I've experienced, both from writing about the mental health system as well as sort of participating in it as both a patient as well as, you know, somebody who's who's been a caregiver on a very kind of low social worker level. And 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 the reality is is that just giving people medication, you know, that that doesn't it, with some people it does help and it does get you to a good baseline where you can work with them and address all of these food sleep and housing issues there's no question I would agree with that I, I definitely see there's that. no question about it I think the percentage of people who antipsychotics because that's what we're talking about here I would say the percentage of people who are helped by these medications in a profound way is actually pretty small if you took a hundred people who had a, a similarly you know bad case of schizophrenia and gave them all, you know, some kind of antipsychotic and appropriate medical care, et cetera, I, I think you would find somewhere between 20 and 30 of them, so 20 to 30 percent of them who were helped, healed, and redeemed by the process. And that's it. You would probably end up with about 60, well, probably about 50 percent who are kind of left in this great middle where they keep cycling back and forth, regardless of whether they're on their meds or not. And then there's a, a smaller group, 10, 20 percent, somewhere in that ballpark, for whom the medication just does zero, just does nothing. And, and I can speak to that having worked at a homeless shelter. I can assure you there's people who take medication. It does nothing for and them. And often, you know, when, when things people aren't responding or they aren't helped, the solution is more medication or let's add medication. The, the, the solution is more, the solution is, 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 is more days in a, is, is more time in a psych unit, more time on the streets and more medication. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and, and, and it doesn't, it does not work. It does not help these people. I think you have to also add to your, your calculation there. There's, there's all these, um, other factors that include like the, the placebo effect, the fact that you're surrounded by people yeah. who are expecting you to be better and that this pill is going to make you better. And that has a powerful effect itself. The fact that there's, you know, there aren't any alternatives being offered. It's like medication or nothing else. There are no alternatives, Will. And, and then the other question would be like, what is the, the, the negative effect that the medications are having, that people are actually that, that middle group that gets actually stuck in the system because they become dependent on the medication, they get into a revolving door relationship with going in and out of the hospital. And then the, the, uh, the long-term impact of, of the harm that gets caused by a lot of the medication for people where it isn't a better, right. a better option. Well, th th this is why I say when I write about the, this stuff on my website that I, and actually when I lecture on it a bit, which I've been doing a little of lately, that I, I can't make the ethical case for forcing people to take antipsychotics. I just can't. Uh, you, you know, the, these are not healthy medicines. Um, there are a small percentage of people who take them who have no problems with the medication. But that's a small percentage, and they're always held up as the poster children by people like the Treatment Advocacy Center and NAMI and so on and so forth as the bright, shining examples of the way everybody with schizophrenia should be. Well, the reality is, is this kind of one-size-fits-all theology that's attached to treating schizophrenia and psychosis is, is incredibly limited in its, in its power. And it's very frustrating. These, these, you know, flat out, these medications are dangerous. Um, there, there's no two ways around it. The prevalence of diabetes, weight gain, metabolic syndrome, heart problems, um, you know, blood lipid increases, i.e. much higher cholesterol, et cetera, et cetera, that it's driven by these medications is just astonishing. 
it also also the long term use of these medications is in the old fashioned term for this is enervating, meaning they just absorb people's spirits and, and sort of slowly, you know, kill off who they are as human beings. And it's it's very sad to see. I think that some of these medications um, cause as much of the negative symptoms that are associated with schizophrenia. And by that, I'm talking about the withdrawal, the social isolation, the depression. And it makes people more, uh, but it makes people, it makes them worse. It makes, it makes people more cooperative in a sense. They're easier to handle as clients when they're, <laughs> when they're withdrawn and shut down and quiet. And well, that's what the system wants because that's all we can provide right now in the American mental health care system. I mean, we, we need a revolution in how we're addressing um, schizophrenia and psychosis in American society. Absolutely. We're spending no research money. I mean, here's what frustrates me to, to hell, Will, and I know it frustrates you, is that none of our federal research dollars are geared towards coming up with alternatives for treating schizophrenia. You know, with the amount of money the National Institute of Mental Health has, which I haven't looked at their budget lately, but I know they get well over a billion dollars a year, you'd think they could carve out a few million dollars and try to set up some experimental situations that are much more psychosocially focused. And because there's pretty good evidence out there now that a good, thorough psychosocial approach can work with more people than uh, are getting help now. And I really think we need to expand those efforts. I, I, I think we need to, you know, I think we need to start asking the big question of, okay, the current system is not working, so what the heck do we do here? Exactly. Because we've been doing, the, we've been doing it this way for 55 years in this country, ever since the introduction of Thorazine in 54. And things have not gotten better. The recovery rates have not improved. I mean, every other area of medicine, if you introduce a treatment, you're supposed to have people recovering. <laughs> you're supposed to have the, the disease or whatever the problem is go down. But actually, it's actually increasing in the case of mental, mental health issues. Actually, I think um, maybe you know the citations for this, um, Philip, but wasn't there a study that came out recently that talked about how the life expectancy of people in the yes. mental health can you tell us about that? The life expectancy of, and I don't know the exact numbers on this, the life expectancy of somebody with schizophrenia has actually gone down in the last 40 or 50 years. And it's as a result of these darn medicines, uh, particularly the atypical antipsychotics, which are almost always the ones used now. Um, you don't use Haldol and Thorazine nearly as much as you used to. And people just, you know, they're, 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 <laughs> you know, their, their, their bodies are ripped apart over time. And I think on the, on the whole, people who are identified as mentally ill are in that category. Um, the life expectancy rate is about 25 years less than the general population. That's the ballpark on it, yes. And this is not explainable by, oh, there's all these suicides, or the people say, oh, it's because yeah. they're more suicidal. Like, no, it's actually, and you can't actually explain it by poverty or malnutrition either. It's really something, it's complicated, and you can't ent entirely pin it on the medications, but the medications have a huge factor here in terms of, of reduce. so you're killing the patients in the name of, of helping them, which is really crazy in, ter in terms of the, of the system. And tell us also about, isn't there a report that's coming out in the Lancet um, that you mentioned right. that, that, that you got a hold of um, early about the, because I think people should remember that, you know, we're, we, the moment that we're at now is kind of the moment we're at before the atypicals came in because they say, oh, well, the older drugs, they don't work very well and they kind of have all these problems. Now let's have <laughs> some new drugs. And so now we've, we've been through this whole thing with the new drugs, supposedly better and they're so much gentler and they don't have the side effects. But now actually that's being exposed as just completely a marketing uh, myth. And there's a new study in The Lancet about that, right? Correct. Um, there is a study by some Dutch researchers that was done on about 500 people aged 18 to 40 with first episode of schizophrenia and how well the atypicals work on treating psychosis and hallucinations and so on and so forth as compared with uh, the older antipsychotics. And in this case, they used Haldol. And what they found is that the uh, newer antipsychotics, and this is in this study, it's Zyprexa, Seroquel, Geodon, and then um, one I can't pronounce that is only used in Europe. It's not used in this country. It's Sanofil or something like that. These drugs just flat out don't work any better than Haldol at treating um, the symptoms of schizophrenia. And the time to discontinuation, i.e. the amount of time that somebody can handle taking these meds, is a little bit longer on the newer meds, but not 
appreciably longer. And yet, of course, as we all know, these newer medications cost 20 and 30 times as much as the older ones and have been a huge source of income for pharmaceutical companies. Antipsychotics are now the third largest revenue producing class of patented drugs in America. They are ahead of antidepressants in terms of sales. I kid you not. Now, most of that doesn't have anything to do with schizophrenia or psychosis. We're using the atypical antipsychotics for absolutely everything in our culture now. Yeah, and um, controlling the elderly in nursing homes and um, ex- yeah, controlling kid, controlling little boys. Con- I mean, I mean, the, the the prevalence, the degree to which these drugs are being used for ADHD in kids is just amazing. It, it's it's it's. I don't use the words I don't use the word scandal very often, but I do here. I, I try not to be a little over the top and superheated with my rhetoric, but I, I've got to tell you, this is a scandal. These drugs should never be. These drugs should never be used in children. They should never be used in the old. There's black box labels on, you know, these drugs causing heart problems in the old, and frankly, they should not be used long term for just about anybody or anything except the most profound cases of psychosis. They're, they just can't justify the long-term use of these drugs. And f- for crying out loud, AstraZeneca is right now trying to get the FDA to approve Seroquel as a monotherapy for depression. They want it to be the new Prozac. And I think there was recently an approval for pediatric bipolar with an antipsychotic. Isn't that right? Uh, that would that would be Risperdal. Risperdal, it, it, yeah. It, and as and Abilify, they got it down to 10 years old. Um, I think Risperdal has got an approval now for for bipolar in kids, and as I pointed out to the FDA, how can you approve it for something that it's a disorder that doesn't even exist in the DSM? And they've very carefully gotten around that by making the approval only go down to 10 years of age. And the um, prior to the approval, it was still happening, but it was off-label use, and now with yeah. the approval, it means that they can start marketing it and putting it in the television ads and the magazine ads and pressuring doctors to get it into the... Well, we're already advertising antipsychotics on television in this country. Um, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, which which markets Abilify, which is actually made by uh, uh, Tsuka Pharmaceuticals in Japan, it's the company that works with BMS in this country. They've been running TV ads intermittently since last summer um, for the use of Abilify in bipolar disorder, and it's it's advertising that is directly marketed at women who suffer from depression and have problems with agitation and insomnia. So as far as medically, as far as those cases go, I'm sorry, that's really like bipolar disorder. This is not people who have mania. This is not people who are psychotic. And, you know, but yet that's acceptable and kosher in our society now. You you run those ads. I mean, this is, they're coming so so close to the mainstream in our society now that they're advertising antipsychotics in women's magazines. And last year, I saw one of the TV commercials for Abilify run during the World Series. I'm not joking. It came well. Actually, it was the American League Championship Series, and it came on. It came on during the final game. I'm sitting there watching the Red Sox and Indians play, and here's this ad for Abilify on the television. And it it's bad. And it's really it's about the marketing of the drugs. It's about how the regulatory apparatus and the the research apparatus as just over the years been much, much more controlled and in the interests of corporate America and any kind of protections that consumers have are just being systematically torn down. I mean, this is happening on the level of the Supreme Court. It's happening on the level of the FDA, the NIMH, throughout our throughout our government. And one of the promises that I think the um, the new drugs, the atypicals, had was also not only would they work better, but that they wouldn't have the side effects. And now we're, we're seeing that's actually not true that the side effects... They're as bad as the old drugs. They're as bad as the old drugs. One of the things I should mention is that Robert Whitaker, um, who wrote uh, Mad in America, he said that sometimes people do get on and they switch from an older drug to a newer drug and they, they feel better. It works for them better. But sometimes, I mean, part of that it may be a placebo effect because of the marketing. But part of it also, he said, is that sometimes the newer drugs are used at a lower dosage than the older drugs were. So it's not about the drug you're on. It's just that it turns out that your dosage is going down and you end up feeling better. I want to share this with your listeners because I don't think this is widely known. Back in November, the state of Arkansas, so this would be the attorney general of the state of Arkansas, filed a lawsuit against Janssen Pharmaceutica and Johnson & Johnson, which are the companies that do Risperdal. 
And there, many of the allegations are, are similar to the Zyprexa lawsuits that have been filed by various states, you know, off-label marketing, um, you know, hiding the risks of the drug, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the bald assertion that the Attorney General of Arkansas, who I assume is a sane man, made is that Johnson & Johnson & Janssen um, cooked the clinical trials of these drugs, basically phonied it up to make their drug look better than Haldol. And I have pressed them to give me their evidence of this because they're not making that assertion for nothing. Um, generally, attorney general's offices are really conservative. When they file lawsuits, they only say things in the lawsuits that they can prove out. And they won't give me the evidence, so I don't quite know how they come to that um, determination that the company cooked the clinical trials. But basically, they're, they're say, they have said that Johnson & Johnson put a drug on the market that Johnson & Johnson knew was defective and knew that it worked no better than the older drugs. And that's at the heart of their lawsuit. Um, you know, some of these lawsuits are just saying incredibly powerful things. Connecticut filed a lawsuit against Eli Lilly two weeks ago, and in it, they're asserting that Eli Lilly were paying off state officials to use the drug in youth detention facilities. I, I've, I'm just flabbergasted. I mean, we're talking about bribery there, and the company was charged under the federal RICO statute, which is the uh, racketeering-influenced corrupt organization's a uh, federal statute that is often used to chase people like drug dealers and the mafia. Do you think we can get them to include this information at the, in the fine print of their advertising in the magazine so we can read about all the different I don't think it would make any difference. You know, f fundamentally, Will, there's, there, there's been such a drift in, in how people view drugs, and by that I mean pharmaceuticals, in our culture that you can fine print and put all these issues and force them to do this and that with the marketing until you know the cows come home and it's not going to affect people. I've tried to, in addition to my website, I started kind of an experiment late last year and I kind of did it for a couple of months this year of cross-posting my things over on Daily Cost, which is you know the most intense, progressive, liberal, you know, do-gooder, lefty, we love everybody and embrace diversity sort of website on the planet. When I would go in there and mildly criticize antipsychotics and antidepressants based upon actual research studies, I would be derided by people in the community on daily costs as a murderer. I can completely believe that. We've had similar kinds of reactions with uh, work with the Freedom Center, and the, the progressive social justice movement has been very, very hesitant and reluctant to just take up really simple, factual kinds of appro approaches to this. It's very, it's very frustrating. Yeah. I think, I, I'll be honest with you, I think conservatives have their heads screwed on straighter about this than progressive liberals do. Um, and I think it's because conservatives just don't trust drugs to begin with. And I think also it has um, to do with the family, the kind of family rights and family protection, some of the driving political forces around opposing screening of kids, screening of kids in schools has been the family rights groups because they, you know, Christian groups right. and family protection and because they, they don't want it, they don't want big government to interfere with um, the rights of, of the family to privacy and things. So yeah, I mean, it's, and also some of the leading Democratic Party politicians have just are completely in the pocket of the pharmaceutical companies and they see it as health care good mental health care good health care good and it's like this very simplistic thing that it's also about their lobbying interests and so a lot of the perspective that we're presenting just isn't even on the map of the of the political discourse and Elliot Spitzer who was you know rec who recently went <laughs> down I mean he was one of the few politicians who was actually going after some of these um, corporate corruption issues in in the background and now we don't have him to uh, to help out on this yeah, yeah he's uh, he he, he <laughs> Elliot Spitzer has left the building <laughs> well I just I have to, this is a little bit off topic but I encourage people to check out Greg Palast's website Greg Palast is a a journalist who's done a lot of really interesting work because he talks about the background of Elliot Spitzer made a lot of really powerful enemies in his investigation into the housing mortgage crisis. <laughs> and uh, there's, yep. there's some question of why is it that they decide to go after Elliot Spitzer's um, prostitutes when there's, there's many politicians that the um, federal government knows have, um, are doing 
kinds of things behind the scenes. Why choose Elliot Spitzer and not <laughs> some of these other people? But we're kind of getting way off of off of topic. And I, this, but I want to kind of bring it back <laughs> to the issue of force. You know, we haven't really talked about the civil liberties issue, and also I want to talk about this idea of insight because, base. I mean, so many people come to me and they say, you know, so and so, my my daughter, my son. Um, they just they don't they don't understand they have a mental illness they don't want medication and they end up you know they have problems they end up picked up by the police they're in a, they don't I don't hear from them for two months they just they just don't have insight and I really when they did, took their medication they were so much better why can't you know we just get these so-called civil liberties people out of the picture and so we can get my son or my daughter force them into the hospital and just get them on the medication, get them stabilized, and then they can come out and live a fulfilling life again. What, what would you say to that? Well, I, 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 would, I would say, first of all, that I, I have a lot of respect for, for families in these situations, even, even where I think their thinking is a bit simplistic and, and isn't particularly well supported by the evidence. I, I, I feel for them. I, you know, I've been in their position. I've worked in a homeless shelter. I've had to talk guys into taking their meds um, because there's nothing else you can do with them at that point in time. I don't. Ha- we don't have a magic place like Soterra to go put them, you know. And it's it's a problem. And I don't know what else I can do for them. And I don't think the families know what else they can do either. But when it comes down to questions of civil rights and stuff, I have always drawn and and let's. Backtrack just one sec so your listeners understand this context. One is, ethically, I can't make the argument for using these medications on anybody, and ethically, I can't make the argument that they should be forced on anybody. Um, I'm sure there are exceptions to that, but they're probably very few. Um, When you get into the medical and legal questions, um, that's where I, I, I become a bit more of a moderate on this issue. For me, the dividing line on forced medication is violence. If somebody, does, if somebody who's diagnosed with a serious mental illness, or frankly anybody in society, undiagnosed or not, starts doing violent things to other members of society who are innocent, who've done nothing to bring it upon them, that's where they start to lose their rights to self-determination about medication and treatment. And it's not a perfect line. I mean, I'm, I'm not 100% comfortable using that as sort of the, the, the proxy for what to do here, but it's the only one we've got, really. And so as long as, you know, my, be, my deal is as long as somebody isn't violating somebody else's rights to, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, then there's no reason to jump up and down upon them, you know? It's when people start doing violent things, and it's pretty uncommon that people with schizophrenia and psychosis do violent things, when they start doing violent things, that's when it's, I'm much more comfortable with the idea of, wow, we're going to have to force these guys into some kind of treatment. Well, let's, let's, get, let's, um, let's look at that a little bit more closely because we're, we're starting to blur a couple of things here. One is, a, is a, a situation where someone is in trouble, they need help, they're having a hard time, however you want to describe it. And then another situation is where a crime has been committed. And I think often in this discussion, it's really important to kind of keep those... Yeah, we need to distinguish between the two. We need to distinguish between those things because, I mean, I personally, I have a lot of problems with the criminal justice system. I, I take a restorative justice approach. I really think that our punishment model doesn't work. But that's a bigger discussion. But there is some rationality to if someone commits a crime, there's a certain amount of punishment, there's containment. We need to actually take, like, physically take them away from society for a time. And so, you know, the example of um, forced treatment that I would use is like drunk driving. If someone is is drunk and they commit a crime by driving their car, in that situation, I don't really personally have a problem forcing them into, um, as punishment, as rehabilitation, forcing them to go and see a counselor or to go into some kind of psychological treatment. When you start to talk about drugging them, though, then it starts to get really, really, you're, you've, you've in, intruded so deeply into their consciousness that I'm wondering, it's like I, w- I would much rather endorse, like, for example, like 24-hour surveillance of someone. Or you might not want to do that with a paranoid you might You might not want to do that. <laughs> I'm, but just, I'm just saying that there, I'm jo- I'm there are all these I'm other joking. ways that we can, um, we can punish people and that we can seek to contain them that maybe don't have this devastating intrusion quality, which is what the medications... Well, well you're really on to something here, in, in my opinion. I, I think you need... I think, you know, as I said at the top, we, we or earlier, we, we need a revolution in how we're addressing this stuff in our culture. 
and we need to you know we need to start trying some other methods here and and you know I think you're pushing the button and asking the right questions and trying to push this in a good direction um the 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 current solution just doesn't produce results as much as anyone would like the problem is is that you know you've got forced medication laws uh, or assisted outpatient treatment laws or whatever the heck you want to call them in i believe 49 of the 50 states now I can't remember what the one state is that doesn't have and them. For people who don't understand what that means, that means that you you get a diagnosis and then you get a court order that says you have to take medication or in the community in your home. Right, and you only usually get the court order, and I, and it differs from uh, from state to state. But I can tell you in this state, the the people who end up with the court orders are the people who are having the real problems. Um, on medication or off medication. That's, that's been and my experience too. I think that these these measures that are taken against people are really because the system doesn't know what else to do. People are in trouble. Exactly. They've tried a lot of things, but they've tried. It's like all they have is a hammer, so they've tried to hit the person with the hammer over and over again, and the nail won't go yeah. in. And so they use um use. No, what we know have. what Einstein said about the definition of insanity is trying to do the same thing over and over again that hasn't worked and expecting different results. Exactly. And uh, and that's exactly what we're doing uh, with these folks. As a matter of fact, it's what we're doing with all sorts of mental health care in this country, not just with people who are extreme cases, but people who are mild cases too. Um, you know, I, I run into all the time cases of uh, people diagnosed with bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, who are on three, four, and five different medications. And it just makes no sense. And sometimes the medications are one is, is lifting them up, one is putting them down. They're on, they're on antidepressants as well as anti-anxiety medications, as well as antipsychotics, as well as mood stabilizers, as well as anticonvulsants. And it's just, it's just a, it's a huge, it's a huge mess. It's a mess. But I wanted to zero in on a real big question, which is this idea of preventive, like preventive um, treatment that, okay, this is somebody who's committed a violent act in the past, um, you know, it might have just, when we say a violent act, it might have been that they threw a punch at a nurse or they, or they, tried, right. they hit, I know one guy who hit his parents with a hockey stick and that was as well, maybe his parents gave him some reason to be angry. Maybe they hit him at some point, you know, who knows the, the whole story here. But then the, then what comes in is the idea of prevention that you have to kind of prevent the person from committing a violent act in the future. And to me, that really violates a basic principle of, of rights. You can't, the police can't come in and arrest you because they think that a crime is going to be committed at some point in the future. No, not unless, that, not unless they have evidence that you're operating in conspiracy to commit a crime. There, there, there is a distinction in the law for that sort of stuff, but you're absolutely correct. And frankly, you, you, you bring up a fascinating point, which is that probably X amount of these people who, who do end up in, in some kind of forced treatment paradigm um, and in the legal system are quite often people who've, who've hit their mom, hit their dad, hit their brother, whatever. And there's a piece of me that, uh, you know, understands that serious and everything, but th the problem is, and I've been around this for years, is families have a really bad habit of getting in patients' faces and setting them off in a way that no one else can. You know, because your mother and your father know you better than anybody else, and, you know, for all we know, they, you know, they've had a rough relationship with their parents. But the problem is, is that people do a bad job of talking to and working with people who are either in active psychosis or, you know, pretty much on edge. They do all sorts of things that just set these folks off. And, you know, schizophrenia, psychosis are pretty much fight or flight situations when things get bad. And of course, somebody's response is going to be to shove somebody or hit somebody. That's just kind of the practical reality of how that's going to play out. In uh, Portland, there was a really just terrible, terrible tragedy of a, uh, a man who was di diagnosed with schizophrenia, James Chassie, and the police just yeah. got a hold of him and beat him to death. And what yeah, happens is that I think I've had a, I did a show about um, some training that's going on with the police, but I think it's a, it's a real problem when you have a police force that's j jacked up and ready to go and carrying guns and they're training and they're in the shooting the shooting gallery, you know, practicing their, their shooting and they're in the gym, you know, boxing and lifting weights and they're ready to go and they're out there and then someone comes along and they haven't, don't have any idea how to communicate with them and that person crosses all the lines of 
we can use force. We can use force. They don't comply. They're not listening. And, and then the police just get a green light. Oh, this is a situation where I can use force. I can. This person isn't saying uncle. They're just, they keep fighting back. And so I can just keep using force on them. And people die as a result of this because they don't, they're not communicating in the way that the police are expecting them to communicate or the way that the, the deadly force regulations are set up. And I think you put your finger on something really, really important which is this is often about communicating between people. It's really not yeah. about a disorder that's inside of one person. It's about a communication problem that parents are having with children. And so what we really need are helpers who really understand this kind of cross-cultural or inter-dimensional inter communication <laughs> issues or how do you de-escalate situations, how do you get through to somebody when they don't seem to understand it. And that's where I think that the peer movement, people who've been through states of madness and who've been in these states can be so instructive. We can say, hey, you know, when I'm freaking out and a guy shows up at my front door and he's got a smile on his face, but he's got a gun, and that's gonna make me feel worse. It doesn't matter if he's a police officer or, or right now you're, you're telling me that I have to go home and live with my parents and I'm supposed to not be violent, you know, because I'm... I yeah, mean, that's it, the worst place you can send me. Exactly, and, you know, there's... I, I mean, and in a lot of cases, it is the worst place you can send people. I mean, the the, the, the very people in our, 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 our culture who, you know, are set up to take care of other family members are family members, and they, they aren't necessarily the right folks to help people out. I mean, I know we lean upon that as the practical solution in this culture, because of the way things are funded and how people own property and so on and so forth. And, you know, it's a, it's a good quick way to get people, you know, housing, for lack of a better example. And, and the problem is that, that that's not necessarily the best situation. There's families who work very well with seriously mentally ill offspring, and there's families who are complete disasters when it comes to it, and frankly, there's probably families who caused it. And we talked about yeah. um, research, and there, there was a lot of really interesting, valuable research that was being done in the 60s and 70s about how families can heal or make worse situations, and that research has just been basically abandoned. I mean, there are some families... Well, it's been abandoned for... It's, it's been abandoned because a lot of the conclusions that were being reached by researchers in the early 60s about psychosis and schizophrenia and mental illness and their relationship to families um, was thought to be stigmatizing, that too many parents were being blamed for causing their kids schizophrenia because, you know, they spanked their kid or whatever. Um, and, you know, researchers just walked away from it because it was unpopular and you couldn't say it. There's, there's bits and pieces of it that are sort of trickling back into the literature, particularly from England, um, where there are some researchers who've looked at these questions and do find that there is a strong connection between people with um, psychosis diagnosed with schizophrenia and, you know, family trauma, for lack of a better term, when, when these folks were young. And I don't know where that research is going to go. I don't know if it's true or not. I've seen examples of people, you know, who are 30, 40, and 50 who clearly had incredibly rough childhoods who would fit that pattern. There's no question about it in my and mind. I think, you're, I think you're right. There was kind of like a, back, a backlash. Says no one wants to blame families. I mean, it's, it's, oh, not, even, it's God, not even no. fair because family members are in a lo larger social context. They're doing the best they they're can. They're doing the best they can. You know? They're in a larger social context. They, are, they themselves were children at some point. They have, they're supposed to be parents, not and, social workers. so work. I think there was a backlash, <laughs> and one of the appeals of the biological disorder, it's in your brain, is that it lets the, the families off the hook. What I'd love to see is us go in a direction where we're saying, hey, how can we help families. We're not going to blame you, but we're going to help you communicate with the the children better. We're going to help whatever conflict is in the background going on. It's not, sometimes it is child abuse and just flat out mistreatment, but sometimes it's just communication styles and people don't know how to talk with each other without putting each other down. And, and that can create paranoia and that can create all kinds of, of problems that lead to getting a mental health diagnosis. Um, Philip, we are almost out of time. I wanted to ask you if you had any last-minute comments about force and the mental health system. I, I do. I wanted to. I wanted to point because you asked this question, and I don't think I answered it. Which is, you know, I, I think you kind of implicitly were asking me at one point, how well do these forced medication paradigms work? And the only research I really know of on this, and I'm talking about real research here, is 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 done by again Jeff Swanson at Duke. 
And he took a look at the outpatient treatment system in the state of North Carolina and basically found that patients who were in that system, um, that the prevalence of violence, and by violence he really just means assault, you know, hitting people, pushing people, stuff, really didn't change. Didn't change much at all. Um, so, you know, the whole question of prevention, does, you know, sticking people in these systems and forcing them to take Zyprexa, does it prevent them from doing things in the future? The question, the answer is no, not particularly. And, you know, there's probably multiple reasons why that's going on. But, you know, the prevalence of violence amongst that group is pretty small to begin with. Um, the reason schizophrenia in particular is such a bugbear voodoo thing in our culture is if you all have ever seen somebody in active psychosis, it looks like they're, it looks like they're going to be violent. It can be, it can be really scary. It can be really scary. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's frightening. I mean, I've worked with these folks as a professional, and it's frightening. It's, it's, it's frightening, for, and I know it's frightening for them, um, and it's, it's frightening for me. And, you know, I have been around, you know, I have friends who've been actively psychotic around me. And, well, I'm not going to identify the person, but I had one who was basically going to attack me. Um, this was several years ago, and I managed to talk this person down from it. I don't know how I did it. It was what kicked in instinctually in the situation, and nothing ever happened and I was able to help them get out of a bad place and I was probably about 20 seconds away from having to kick the living crap out of a friend of mine and you know in order to protect myself you understand and it's one of the weirdest episodes in my life and I want to hit my friends um, particularly since this one was female um, but you know it, this is tricky stuff um, I, I think you know, we can never answer these questions completely and fully and as comfortably as we want to. And I suspect there's X percentage of your, you know, your listeners are going to have problems with me using a term like schizophrenia, you know, as opposed to persons diagnosed with schizophrenia. You know, the reality is, is I use the shorthand because that's what the broader culture understands now. And, you know, and the situation is so dire that I'm not too worried about what language we use right now, no matter how stigmatizing anybody finds it, because we got bigger problems, we got bigger fish to fry than whether we call somebody, you know, bipolar or schizophrenic or a person diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Well, Philip, it's been really great having you on the show today on on Madness Ray. Just um, tell us your your website so people can find out more and, and read your incredible. It's an incredible blog. It's got great stuff on it. I really encourage people to check it out. It's FuriousSeasons.com, and thank you for the compliment and thank you for the work you do and uh, and and thanks to your listeners for your giving a damn about these issues. This, this is stuff that's you know, under the surface in our culture that is incredibly important and plays out every day in America, and we're spending tens of billions of dollars to address this, and it's getting us nowhere. Philip Dottie, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Thanks. You've been listening to an interview with Philip Doughty. Philip is an award-winning um, journalist, and he is the author of the website FuriousSeasons.com. That's Furious, F U R. I-O-U-S, seasons.com. That's about all the time we have this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is broadcast every Wednesday, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Pacifica Affiliate, WXOJLPFM 103.3 Valley Free Radio in Northampton, Massachusetts. For our live internet stream, podcasting, show archives, and more, visit madnessradio.net. Madness Radio is co-produced by Freedom Center and The Icarus Project. For more information, check out freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. For more on mental health radio, listen to the news hour from mindfreedom.org, Wednesdays, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, or you just want to share what's in your head, contact us at radio at madnessradio.net.
KWMD Kasilov, 90.7, Anchorage, 104.5.